This is education, finance policy, and the budget. Big topic. I've been uh, lucky to be have been a part of uh, Brad James's presentations now for several years, and uh, they're terrific and really helpful. So why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about what you're planning on doing. It was uh, uh, Senator Williams that really started getting us to think last week about, hey, what's in that budget? You know, we hear it's it's a little bit of this, it's a little bit of that. So why don't we kick things off with that? And then when we have to leave, we'll leave and we'll come sure. back. Sure. First of all, I'm Brad James, Agency of Education. Uh, this is not going to be a dynamic talk. <laughs> I just, sorry. <laughs> I said this is not something that's exciting to talk about. Particularly. That's how I sold it. So. <laughs> okay. Well, then we'll pretend it's dynamic. <laughs> um, Basically, I'm going to talk about basically what the Ed Fund's doing. Um, I don't know too much about really what school districts are doing for FY24 because right. they're in the process of making budgets right now and I haven't seen any data from them. So what I will talk about is more details of the FY23 Education Fund because I do know what happened for that one right. and such. So, um, so I'm, you guys are all kind of new to me, except for Senator yeah. Campion. Um, I'm, I'm Education Finance Director at, at the Agency of Education, and basically what I do is I kind of run the Ed Fund. <laughs> I, guess, I guess it's kind of what I do. Um, and what that means is that I make sure that school districts get the proper amounts of money that they expect to get. I make sure the taxes, you know, I, I tell the towns what to do with the money the education proper taxes they raise on how to direct that money because it's state money where it should go and when it should go um, I work with school districts I work with the, the, largely with the business managers um, helping them out to understand everything that you guys are doing how the, how the process works and what the funding formula is and um, you know I, I, bas I basically takes I guess if you really cut it short I basically take school budgets and turn them into tax rates and working with the tax department. Um, and it's, that's kind of the process over the year that, that we do it. And so I do all those things that are behind education and funding that nobody likes. <laughs> that's what I do. So what I have here um, is, is this is FY23 because I don't have, excuse me, on my finger work, two, three, four, five, six, no, five of you. Yep. I hate an embryo. This is FY23. Um, because as I said, I don't have. Our, uh, sure. Oh, you go. Um, this is this is FY23, and I, I kind of muted it because when I let Excel do it, it looked like this. It was kind of brighter colors. <laughs> but I didn't want to suck down all the tone of the printers. Um, so what, what this is just doing is kind of relative size of the different parts of the education fund. FY23, the total here is 1,000, one, I should say 1 billion 966. These are in millions of dollars here, but it's 1.966 billion dollars, so almost 2 billion dollars. For FY24, we are projecting to be just over 2 billion, so 2 billion, I want to say 72, 76 million, something like that. Okay, but what 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 would happen within within this? I'll hold this one up to you guys to see. What would happen is the the relative size of these won't change with one exception, or won't change significantly. I should say with one exception. And, and I'll, I'll, I'm I'm going to go through this in a little more detail, but I'll get to it. Um, the one exception is universal school meals. Last last session, the legislature put in 29 million dollars as one time funding for FY23 universal school meals, and that's that block right there where my finger is. Okay, that's, that's that block. If I was to do this same graph for FY24, that block would not be there because right now it's zero. I don't know if you guys are talking about putting more money into it for, to continue this program forward, but right now the way the law is currently constructed, that would not be there. Okay, that, that's the real signature. Otherwise, things would, they would look pretty much identical almost. Okay. So we'll come, we'll come back to this one. And so if I get myself organized, it's not always my strong suit. Um, what I have now is just kind of what the education fund itself looks like for FY 22 and 23. And I have you had Julia Richter in here? Not yet. Okay. So Julia is, is for those who do not know her, she's, she's a joint fiscal analyst. And she it, she kind of keeps track of the Ed Fund and send, and sends things out. And we'll keep one. It's you guys back there. Yeah. 
Do you have one for our assistant? Just so uh, yeah, I think we sent three up this way. Thanks. You're welcome. Did, did, did you go and send? We did. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so what what this what this is is this is this is the sources and the uses um, on, on the actual Ed Fund balance sheet it says appropriations not uses which is truly what it is I use them as uses but this is kind of showing you what's happening where the money comes from but what we're really focused on today I think is what the money's being used for yeah. okay and so you can see that in FY twenty four. If, if we look down at the bottom the line is one else oh it is welcome back to senate education 247 in the afternoon on tuesday january 17th we were just uh, briefly interrupted by a fire drill we're now back with brad james in the chair mr james where you left off please wonder where that was so we were I believe we were talking about the Ed Fund outlook, um, looking at FY23 versus FY24 uses. And the FY24, again, as I, I think is what I was saying when, when they told us that the alarm was going off, um, was that, that these are numbers that, that are not, we, have, we don't really know what the numbers are yet. These are our forecast numbers, what, what the December 1 letter was based on from the tax commission. Um, and then the FY23 numbers themselves are actually not finalized. Would you remind us that what the December 1 letter said, sure. just for those who haven't had an sure. opportunity to read it. What the December 1 letter does is, is it's the tax commissioner works with a number of us, me from AOE, uh, joint fiscal people, two, the two state economists, the tax department, the fifth floor, to make idea, to make an educated guess is probably the best way to put it, of what the yield would be based on what we think is going to happen, what the demands are on the Ed Fund and what the sources coming into the Ed Fund are. So what what he's doing is he's 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 recommending the the property yield, the income yield, and the non homestead property tax rate. That's what he's doing. And the yield, the property yield, is what drives your tax rate. It basically it says if if the yield, I think it's fifteen thousand four hundred fifty seven thousand seven dollars. I think something like that, fifteen thousand four five seven. I believe right around there. Um, what it basically says is that for every dollar you spend on your students, and when I say students, I mean, in my role, it's an equalized pupil, it's how we count students for funding purposes. Um, for every $15,457 you spend on that student, your tax rate is a dollar. If you spend 10% more, your tax rate is 10% higher, so a dollar ten. If you spend 20% more, it's a dollar twenty, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's what the school districts are doing. And that's, they're looking at these numbers that the tax commissioners come out with on December 1 to help them plan their budget as to what the tax rate is going to be. That's what voters tend to look at a lot of times. Not necessarily how much they're spending, but a lot of them are looking also at what their tax rate is as opposed to what they're spending. So, so that's, that's kind of what the December 1 letter is doing. The other side of it is the income yield. That's for people who, whose household income is below $90,000. Um, and that number was $17,600. And I can't remember what the non-homestead tax rate is. But what, what the tax commissioner's letter said was that tax rates will go down. Tax rates will probably go down on average across the state. But taxes themselves will actually increase by 3 to 3.5%. Three and, and that has to do with the value of the properties and everything at this point. So even though the rate may go down, the taxes people pay will probably go up. So that's that's what the December one letter is. And then as time progresses, and as <clears throat> excuse me, as school boards approve their budgets, business managers will send them to me, and then I'll start talking with House Ways and Means, saying here's where I think these numbers are going to come into, and then they'll start looking at what the yield should really be. And then after telling me we have a better idea, and at that point somewhere towards the end of the session, the yields are happening. The, the yields are finalized and set into statute. Or not just that, session law. Okay. So that's what the simple one letter is doing. What is the starting point for all that? Okay. Questions? Mm -hmm. right all right, please. Are we on this, uh, so we're on this uh, fiscal year 24 education fund outlet? Yeah. Just a, a curiosity question on tech, uh, tech ed. It's like a 50% drop. Yes. Um, just curious. <laughs> Footnote, footnote, oh, footnote, A down there. No, no, I, should, I didn't, I didn't asterisk it. Um, last year, at the end of the session, again, what the legislature did is they took $15 million 
and they did a one-time payment to CTE centers. To, that's, what, that's what we've done there. But, but they, they did a one-time payment to them to, for uh, facilities yeah. and to upgrade programs and such. Right. That, that's what it's for. So, so it was one-time money. So it's like forward spending? Yes, uh, that'd, be, that'd be one way of thinking about it, I think. Well, was it surplus money? It was, it was from the bottom line. Yeah, last, last year there was a very, very large surplus in the Ed Fund. A lot of it got used to bring the yield up, tax rates down, um, but they also used $15 million for that. They started, um, the, they added a fifth, that line 19 there, 15.1 million, the ongoing normal cost of teachers. Oh, oh that's supposed to be P-E-B, I have that backwards. I thought I fixed that, I did it on another sheet. My apologies, it's to be O-P-E-B, not O-B-E-P, because it's other post-employment benefits. Um, my dyslexia must be kicking in or something. Um, they start, that was the first year for that. They, they put in $50 million, and then they also used $29 million for the universal school meals as, as a one-time payment. So that, that all came out of the bottom line of the Ed Fund last year. And, Please. If I could. Um, and on line 18, teachers' pensions, normal cost. By putting in the caveat normal cost, uh, obviously <laughs> you're driving towards there's, a, there's more what, yeah, more this, between the lines here. What, my, I, I'm not an expert on um, that pensions by any means, but my understanding of normal cost is, is is what is based on actuarial values. So they said this is what you have to pay every year, and I think that's what they mean by normal cost in order okay. to bring down. Then then the state, the legislature at times puts other money on top to bring bring that um, that cost down. Okay, and, and what just, is a, just a curiosity question. At some yeah. point, is there a pension subject matter expert that comes in and discusses status? Yeah, we absolutely can. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to do that. It will not be me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, um, so what, what I, t I talked about this at first. What you can see is that um, this year, the, the I'm, I'm going to. This is in millions again. So it's 2,076 million that we're forecasting for FY24 versus that one million, one, 1,966 million for FY23. Okay, a large part of that increase is that very first line, the education payment. And the vast majority of that, roughly everything but about a million dollars, is what we think or what we projected school districts are going to actually be spending. Uh, when school districts build a budget, what they're, what they're doing is they're, they're taking in all their expenditures, what they're going to do, how much they're going to spend, that's, that's what we need to know. And then they build a revenue budget to offset it, so they sum, they sum to zero is, is the idea. Within that revenue budget, within that expenditure budget, are certain certain costs that have dedicated revenue, such as federal funds. Okay, so part of their budget is covered by federal money, so you can back that out. You don't, we don't have to pay for that, okay, because that's covered by federal money. The state also gives other categorical grants, such as special education aid, transportation aid. Um, we do small schools and, and merger support grants. Um, I said transportation. Those are monies that are coming out of the education fund, which we'll talk about momentarily. But that also reduces their what's called education spending. So you take, you start with their budget, and you start backing out certain revenues. And you come up with a figure called education spending. And that's the number that goes into the education fund on that line. What I had there, line number 10. Okay, that's, that's the vast majority. So, so during the COVID years, was were, were there any savings at all? There were. And were the, they applied? They, they, yes. Um, they were applied, my understanding from talking to business managers, they were applied over a couple of years. Um, initially, what the legislature had planned, because the ESSER money was coming in unexpectedly, because nobody expected that year, was the ESSER money was able to to take, to replace some of the, the uh, state, the local money, and that's not local, local the state money, because we don't really have local money in Vermont. Um, and, and so there, there was money that, that was coming. Some of it came back to the Ed Fund that, that, that year, or I guess for the following year. But uh, other, other school districts kept it as a surplus and rolled it forward. So we've, we've had some pretty high surpluses being used these last couple of years. And a lot of it has to do with the ESSER funds. Good question. Okay, please. Okay, so what, what you can see here is that, I'm now gonna talk in billions because it's easy for me. Um, on, on line 10, in, in FY23, we're, this number is pretty solid. We're gonna spend about $1.58 billion, billion with a B. 
and we're projecting $1.71 billion in FY24. That was based on me talking to the business managers um, and saying, what do you think is going to be happening? They said, we think our costs are going up. And is that, I'm curious, is it the inflationary sorts of impacts that we're all talking about? A lot, a lot of it is inflationary. <laughs> there, there, there's a lot of money that was put into salaries and benefits for the staff. Um, there, there are a lot of, of un, unmet capital needs they need to do that they've been they've been working on. Um, there's, they said inflation that would cover the fuel costs and things like that. What about uh, health care costs? Health, yeah, thank you. I know there's another one. Health care costs are going up too. Um, so, so all these things are just kind of adding to it. A lot of it's out of their control to a degree. So, based on what they what they said, I I took the districts that reported to, which is over half, that said this is what we think our, our education spending is going to be, not, not the total budget, but the education, that subset, what the education spending is going to be. And I looked at what they spent last year. So, so, that, so that I'm comparing, here's, what, here's where they think they're gonna be here. And I looked at what that percentage was on average for the state, it was 8.3%. Some of them are at 16% increase, some are 15, 10, 12, some are down to five, I'm not sure anybody went went south and or went decreased. But, but so my recommendation that is behind the education spend part of the, of the, the December 1 letter was an 8.3 increase for the state. Hopefully that's the right number or too high, preferably too high, which would mean that the yield could then go higher and bring tax rates down as opposed to working the other way. If unfortunately like this current year we're in, based on what business managers had told me, I put in a number, I think a 5.1% increase growth, 5.2, something like that. And the numbers came, no, I, mean, was, I think it's 5.4.1 or 2. I mean, the numbers came in about a percentage point higher, which meant that there was a bigger demand on the Ed Fund than we had anticipated. So things changed, but we had this huge surplus come in and save the day for everybody. Um, so it's, it's, it, when we're doing the December 1 letter, we try to err on the conservative side. Because at the, towards the end of the year, it's better for everybody, including you guys, who have to pass things, to, to, to be able to raise the yield from the December 1 letter as opposed to bring it down. Because right now, people are, are looking at what their tax is going to be based on that December 1 number. And you, want, you, you prefer it to come down towards the end as opposed to be going, it's to be going up. So that's kind of where we are with this. But that's, that's, what, that's the biggest drive that you're seeing, that that's $23 million. That's, that's a $35 million increase. Uh, I don't know, 135 million dollar increase over over um, FY23. Senator Williams, is the education uh, percentage out to the municipalities so they can do their budgets? The, the, the yeah, the December one letter goes to all the superintendents, all all the school districts. They all they all have it. The, the, it you know gets put out in the paper, so every, everybody knows kind of what it is if they if they want to know. Um, the school district budget and the, and the town budget are are, are separate. Right. So they are they are separate. But I know that in the past, when when money came in from one reason or another from the legislature to drop school tax rates, town tax rates tended to go up to fill the gap. So taxpayers didn't really get any relief. Yep. <laughs> you know, but I was just recently dealing with the town budget yeah. as a select friend. And yeah. That was part of the problem. We really couldn't come yeah. up with the solution. Right? Yeah, it's it's hard. And so that's yeah, it, this is where everybody's out there right now working on what we think is going to happen. We'll find out what is going to happen as this time progresses. Mr. James, I didn't prepare you for this question, but I'm just curious, I mean where you're sitting. Has Act 46 saved the state money? I don't think so. Okay. Um, I haven't. I haven't gone out and asked. I think it has in some place. I know that talking to business managers, a lot of people said they they are able to do things far more efficiently. Okay. But a lot of places have also hired more staff because they they were addressing needs that they had cut before. Okay. So they found some efficiencies, and then maybe they they and they hired some additional staff with yes. those kinds of yes. savings. Okay. That that's that's a lot of what I've heard. Just the anecdotal managers. kind. Yeah. Of so 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 while costs themselves have not necessarily gone down, hopefully. What's happening with the students is has has increased and gotten better, okay. that, but that's that's my understanding from talking to people. Yeah. Um, so back back to this just very quickly. Um, on line eleven is now special education. 
Um, this is, FY23 is the first year that we went to the census block grant. Um, we used to be a reimbursement. So this is, this is actually a lower number than we usually have on this line. And with the way the formula works, if there's inflation, it's going to go up to from 214 to $226 million. Then state place students, um, the costs have been going up with those, so we made an estimate that to, to increase it. And if, if, we, if we're over, we always give the money back for the next year. Tell me what the remind us, state place students. State place students are those students who are, who are um, removed, you, generally speaking by DCF, D yeah. uh, uh, Division for Children and Families, or yeah, I think that's it. Um, and they, they're living somewhere else. They're not with their, their parents. Um, and it's, it's not a huge, huge population, but it's an expensive it's population. An expensive population. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, and they, unfortunately, they move quite often. Uh, Center of Brewer. And, and then a, a number of them are going out of state, too, and that, that also costs. Thank so. you. Um, getting back to special ed costs, mm -hmm. in FY 2022, when we were still doing the reimbursements, was the number, what, what, how did the number compare? If I recall correctly, it was a, it was higher than in, than in uh, the twenty three. I want to say it was around two hundred twenty nine million dollars. Okay. I'm I'm not one hundred percent sure I'm right on that, and I didn't bring my computer. But no, so it just yeah, thanks. I but can it, but it, it, it it did yeah. drop down. Okay. Um, it doesn't mean overall costs went down for for districts. Right. Because because the block grant people used to want the block grant, so we want a census block grant. Then they got it, so we're not getting as much money. So that that's what a block grant is. It's an average amount. Right. You know, so yeah. Yeah, we're working that's we're working through that now, grants. but but it doesn't necessarily mean that special education costs themselves have gone down. It's just what the state is using as a categorical grant as yeah. decrease. Interesting. Transportation is a formula. Um, it, it grows by the NEEP index, the New England Economic Progress. It's a it's consensus figures from the two state economists. I'm one of whom I saw out there while during the fire drill. Um, mm -hmm. um, and then we just talked about tech education on line 14. Um, that that 30.5 has that figure has that 15 million dollars in there for one-time money. So it's closer to 16 million in reality. Small schools, um, there may be. I, I increased that one a little bit. It's actually fairly flat. But Can I you just give the committee a little background. Sure. Small schools grant. <clears throat> small. This small, is new to small. Small. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I forget. Yeah. No. That's what <laughs> I, I just I, please please interrupt me. Yeah. Anytime. No. Of course. Um, small. Small schools grants are basically grants that the legislature set up years and years and years ago under Act Six, and then they expanded it a couple years later. Um, and it's basically to, to give us additional funds to a school that has, that has a small population. And basically what it's looking at now is it's looking at your average grade size. If it's 20 or less, you're, you're considered to be a small school. That's your average grade size, so two-year average. Um, with the mergers that happened under Act 46 that Senator Campion just referred to, um, we don't have such small school districts anymore. We used to have multitudes of small now. school districts. Now we have far, far fewer because the merged and made larger school districts. So they're not eligible. Um, and so the law got changed a little bit to just say schools as opposed to the district. But what happened was, be, as an incentive to merge, the, the legislature wrote, wrote Act 46 to say that if you merge, then you can take your small schools grants that any of your districts had two years prior and get them as a merge support grant and keep them in perpetuity. Um, and, um, until you close that school or until the legislature changes its mind. And so, so that's why I said the numbers have become fairly consistent now around eight, that $8 million figure because most districts are not getting a small school grant per se because most districts have become unified and they're getting merger support grants. What happened in the uh, Weeding Bill Act 127 that I think we'll talk about some other time yeah. Um, is that that the the researchers came up with a, a weight for sparsity, which had, and and based on having a small school and sparsity, you know, low population, and so what they did is is the legislature when they passed it said, we think that because we're going to have this weight in there, we're not going to give additional money for the small schools grant, which is the calculation. Merge support grants still go forward, but the small schools grants will end, I think, in FY twenty five. So there's there's one more year. There's one district that will probably get it, and maybe two. They'll probably get it this year. So, does that cover small schools for folks? Um, number line 16 then essential early education. Again, that's formula driven by the by the New England Economic Progress, the NEEP uh, inflation. It's it's in statute, so it just grows. 
um, and that's for kids who are ages three to five. Flexible pathways, um, if you want to talk about that, I'm not the right person, I can give you a quick idea. And I, I, there's more information on the next sheet that we'll talk about, or I'll just tell you and we'll blast through it. But it's, that's early college, dual enrollment, um, high school completion. like this. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> We're paying for that. <laughs> um, then we talked about teachers' pensions, normal cost, and what I think it is. Um, the ongoing normal cost of my of teachers, OPEP, not OBEB. <laughs> Um, universal school meals we talked about, and then there are other uses, accounting, auditing, um, probably probably other costs that I don't necessarily know about in the background, but it's about $3.4 million. And that's kind, of, that's kind of what is happening. So you kind of compare the two years, see how it's changed. Now this, this third sheet that I just can't, that I put on your desk, it, again, we're still talking, we don't know about 24, so I'm talking about FY23. This is just kind of breaking things out in more detail as we just talked about. So if you wanted to go to, if we were talking about flexible pathways, number line 17, of course I don't have the numbers lined up. That was pretty useful. My apologies. <laughs> I just realized what I did. Um, the flexible pathways is number four on here. Nice, nice job crosswalk, Brad. Um, and it, that, it's $8.4 million and it just kind of gives you, these are the parts of the flexible pathways. Um, the last one, dual enrollment, half of that comes out of general fund. What, what is dual enrollment again? Dual enrollment is, is when um, juniors or seniors can take up to two college courses. Oh. For free. So, so it's, it's a, like not, not early college, which is right. full-time college, but it's, it's, it gives you, you, you can get two college credits. Hey, did you I, do dual enrollment? Then, you, so where did you take your two classes? Uh, one virtually through CCB and yep. the other one in person taught by a Spalding instructor okay. via CCB. And, and a lot of them are taught by high school teachers, um, and a lot of them are taught by college professors. And those are now college credit for you? Yes. Great. Where was it in person? That's all in school? Yes, it was taught by one of our teachers. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, so what, what, I'm, I'm not going to go through this, but it just kind of details a little bit of, of, of the information that I know out there. Tech education kind of says what those pieces are, plus that $15 million, I can write that in there. Um, if you go to the last one, though, line 12, or on the, on the back side, okay, number 12, that's the, that's the big one after what's the number 10 on the first sheet that had that, that 1.577 billion, okay. This, what this did is, what I did is I took information from budgets. When I, when I collect budgets to, to calculate tax rates, I get, I get information at, at a fairly high level. Um, so what I did is I broke it, I broke it out into, into the major pieces and gave you the numbers here. Now these are budget numbers, they're not education spending. So they're not talking about backing out these revenues out of some of the federal money, special education, things like that. These are, these are actually what they budgeted. Because I don't have that detail when I collect it to, to be able to say this. So the total of this is like $1.94 billion versus $1.578 here, roughly. Um, and that's because I did not, I didn't have the, the information to back out the offsetting revenues to get to education money. But it gives you an idea of what the, where the money is going and what it's being used for. Okay. And you can see that the, the largest one is, is at the very top, that $1.1 billion. That's for, that's for salaries and benefits. That's, that's by far and away the largest. So. Yeah. Um, in what, what line item were we buying construction and renovation? Is that in that? Um, it is. It's, it's, it's like right here where it's 4,000 facilities that so acquisition that's and construction. That's 1.4 million? It, no, 10.8. 10, 10 oh, there. Yep. About, about, uh, about, uh, half, about halfway down. Right? Okay. And I did, I, we, we talked about surpluses. I can't remember, I feel, I'm not sure who asked. But I did look to see, it's not on here, it's the revenue. But I did look to see what were the surpluses for FY23 that were used. It was about $46.7 million. It was, it was a large number. Yeah. And I think in the past, it's probably closer to $20 million statewide. So. Uh, so I, I just have a quick question. We, so, so regarding the school construction, uh, where exactly does that money go? Because, and the reason that I'm asking is because, and correct me if I'm wrong, but we heard that a new school hasn't been built in how many years? A long time. A long time? Yeah, yeah I'm not sure how many. Yeah, so so what, what does that money do is my question. 
This right now, well, I mean, when, when people do serious renovations, major renovations, when they or if they did construction of some sort, not even the whole school, partial of like an addition or something like that, they usually bond for it. They use it for twenty years, mm -hmm. and so what, what we're looking at here are the, the principal and interest payments of each year is what we're looking at here. Oh, from the bonds for, for, for the bonds, okay. yeah, yeah, and and that that would also go back to your one point four million down there too. That there's part it's part of that. Um, so that that's kind of that's kind of what's doing. There is, um, you know, we we have not had construction aid from the state since two thousand eight, when it was I don't know if they use the word suspended or moratorium is one or the other, and we just haven't had the money to to, to put it in there. Um, I believe Secretary French will be talking about that with you. I think later. Yeah. And Hayden, would you ask uh, Treasurer Pichek to come in next week and let's jump into the bonding and school construction stuff with him? Yeah. Okay. You mean, oh, did you say treasurer of PJ? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's kind of what I have, unless there are other questions. I didn't want to overwhelm you with talking uh, too much. With no, the it's helpful. I hope <clears throat> yeah. Brad's a great resource. Uh, he has, a, people probably know he has a contract for life, so he will be here <laughs> until that, that day comes. <laughs> <clears throat> Yes, I've got an awful wall question, and you may not have the answer, but Act 46, the municipalities gave up their school building if they, if they bought it for Act 46, correct? The, if, if the school districts closed a building, right. the town, the municipality could buy it for no. a nominal sum. Right. Yeah, okay. yeah. And so I think some did. I don't think a lot did, because right? they haven't closed a lot of schools. They closed right. some, but not, not many. And that's, again, going back to Senator Campion's question, has Act 46 dropped the cost? Right. You're not going to drop the cost you start closing buildings, frankly, because buildings <laughs> need people, right. and that's where the cost is. And, and if, you're not, if you're not closing a building, then you're going to still have a lot of people. Um, and, you know, that's, that's good and bad. Yeah, I'm not putting it out there. You're going no, sure. But, that, but that's, really, that's really where the cost savings will come in. And there have not been that many school closures since right. Act 46. Now, people are talking about them. But that's that's why you saw um, Ripton thinking about mm -hmm. getting out. That's why you see Lincoln pulling out now. They'll they'll be their own school district. Um, there there are other talk. There's I think there are a couple others who have talked about it, but they, they haven't gotten that point. But they're, they're, the people people in small towns want to save their local school. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks very much. You're very welcome. Sure. So nice meeting everyone. Good seeing you. Good seeing you as well. Be around for questions. Great. Yep. I mean, I just need two minutes, uh, so let's just take two minutes, uh, and then we'll come right back and we'll jump into PCBs. Welcome back to Senate Education. Uh, last year, the legislature uh, passed a bill that started a process mandating schools be tested for PCBs. Uh, we had done uh, lead testing maybe two years prior to that working on that issue and then PCBs we started this process a little bit last year and what we've asked uh, Ms. Capolino and Ms. Briggs Campbell to talk about is where things are at and feel free of course if you'd like you know, thank you, uh, to back up and, and tell us a little bit how we got here and uh, the legislation itself with that thanks so much both of you for being with us um, so it looks like most of you might have the presentation. We do all have the presentation. Yes. So I'm going to go over how we got to where we are, and then where we are, and then I'll right. open it up for all of the questions that you have. So we'll start with, you know, what are PCBs, just so you understand the context of this chemical. Um, so they are a group of human-made chemicals that were commonly used in building materials um, and electrical equipment before 1980. Um, they were used in cocks, paints, glues, plastics. I like to say, think of the building product that you would like to see stay elastic, and it was added to that to keep the elasticity there. Um, and then also used in um, fluorescent lighting ballasts, transformers, and capacitors, um, mostly for their electrical insulating properties. So wide uses in everything. Um, in, in uh, 1979, the US EPA banned the use of PCBs. Um, there's a lot of different ways we refer to PCBs, and just so that you understand, there's 209 different types of PCBs. So 209 single types of PCBs. Um, they're called congeners. 
um, Monsanto took these different PCBs and they put them into their own separate mixtures to be used for all of the different uses I mentioned, and those are called aerochlores. And that was Monsanto's brand name for the use of, the, of PCBs. And so when you look at what we report out and how we look at these, we, we compare them to aerochlores. That's the type of sampling that we're doing at these schools. <clears throat> um, there also is a lot of discussion around units and measurements, so I wanted to make sure I covered that also. So there's different ways to measure PCBs, and it's really by media. And so for indoor air, um, we measure PCBs as a nanogram per meter cubed, and that's a part per trillion. In water, we measure PCBs as a microgram per liter that turns into a part per billion. And then for solids like soils and building materials, we measure it as a milligram per kilogram, which is a part per million. And so when we go from part per trillion, which is the smallest, up to a part per million, which is the largest, um, that's the way you should look at our measurements. So a part per trillion is, is really small. And what I say to most people when I'm talking to them about um, our standards and how we look at different ways of measurement is the smaller it is, it's usually the, the worse it is for you. And so we're measuring something that's really small and it also um, causes health issues. Um, so I'm going to talk about that just for a second. So PCBs do cause serious health problems. Um, the potential for health effects from PCBs, as with other chemicals, depends on how much, how long, and how often you're exposed to them. Um, but numerous studies show that PCBs can cause effects to the nervous, immune, reproductive, and endocrine systems, um, and they are considered carcinogenic, so they can cause cancer. Um, and they are also biocumulative in the environment, so they build up in fatty tissue um, and will persist for many, many years. Um, so that is a quick 101 on PCBs. Um, if we want to jump into how and why we're here. Um, I heard you talking about Burlington High School, and that was really how everything started, and I'm happy to, to jump in and talk a little about Burlington High School, but I'm going to jump right into the legislation that happened after the findings at Burlington High School. Um, and so we started in 2021, which was H439. Um, everything that you see on your PowerPoint or your printout that is not bolded came out of the 2021 legislative session. In 2022, there were some changes made, and that came in H740. Um, and those changes were that we extended the date for the time frame that schools needed to complete all the sampling to 2025. It was initially 2024. Um, and then in the end, where there's uh, the release language, um, it was changed from all buildings to um, public schools and approved and recognized independent schools. Um, I did want to step back just for a second and explain why the release language is important and it, and it does tie into Burlington High School a lot. When all of the work started in Burlington, the Department of Environmental Conservation and the Department of Health really had no regulations on releases of PCBs in indoor air. Our release language is very specific to releases to the environment. So think about releases to groundwater, surface water, sediments, not indoor air from building materials. And so the release language, language was changed to allow for the Agency of Natural Resources to have some jurisdiction um, in regulating these releases to the, what, you know, the environment now. Um, and then in 2022, you'll see at the end that there was some funding provided to the Agency of Education to help um, assist where PCBs were identified in schools. So we started our program. There is a lot that um, the agencies and the specific agencies that are partnered um, on the school program as the Agency of Natural Resources was given the direction to be the lead agency with assistance from the Agency of Education and um, the Department of Health. So the three agencies have been working very closely to try and pull together a program. This is um, the only program in the nation right now that is sampling for PCBs in schools. Um, one of my colleagues likes to say, therefore, it is the best program in the nation, um, and I like to keep it that way. Um, but there's also a lot of interest in what we're doing, and I get frequent calls from other states that are also looking at this or finding this issue in their schools and looking for guidance from us. So back to our program, um, ANR Health and the Agency of Education. The first thing we needed to do when legislation was passed um, was 
to determine how we were going to prioritize the schools for sampling. Um, so we put a survey out. We identified that there are 324 schools minus 40 that we're still waiting to respond. So 364 potential schools in the state that are built or renovated before 1980 that need to go through this process. Um, we asked a lot of questions in the survey, um, basically construction dates if they knew it, um, whether or not there was any work that was going to happen, and we looked at the percentage of free and reduced lunch population within that school. Based on that information, we prioritized the schools to put them into timeframes for when we could move through the process to sample them. Um, looking at that, there is a schedule on our website that talks about which quarters of the year schools are expected to start their work. Um, the next thing that we did was uh, Agency of Natural Resources contracted with consultants and that was the $4.5 million that the legislature gave us to do inventory and indoor air sampling. It's a two-step process that we have the consultants do. The first step is they go to the school and they do a full inventory of all the spaces in the school and they identify all of the potential PCB containing materials that might be in those spaces. They take that information and they put them um, the spaces into groups. Within the groups, we ask the consultant to sample 30% from each group. Um, this has been proven to be very beneficial for us in identifying the specific sources and being able to carry that information into the other groups um, that are sampled and identifying those PCB sources. Just a curiosity to put this in context, has this actually kicked off? Yes. Have you started? Okay. That'll be the final okay, slide, really? I think. <laughs> Um, part of this process also involved us having school action levels, so we needed to have a standard to be able to compare what our indoor air values were. Um, and so on February 2nd, 2022, Agency of Natural Resources adopted interim standards that were given to us by the Department of Health. Those values are below there based on age. So for pre-K, it's 30 nanograms per meter cubed, the part per trillion, 60 nanograms per meter cubed, and 100 nanograms per meter cubed. Um, after the indoor air sampling happens at the school, there's a joint letter that goes to the school that discusses what the results of the indoor air sampling was and then provides occupancy options to the school so that kids can stay in the spaces that they're learning in um, or look at ways to reduce use of those spaces but continue to stay in classrooms. Um, after we send the letter, uh, we give the school 10 days to look at what the results are and make a decision on what occupancy option they want. We also schedule a meeting with them with the three agencies to go over the letter, make sure they understand it, and ask us any questions that they might have. And if I can just interject really briefly, because all of the, the work that Trish has Explain the development of the standards, the inventory, the grouping, that this, you know, all of those processes, that was the program that was outlined in statute, right? The actual, the testing, right? Everything that follows after you get the results, that sort of, the, what sort of was not addressed in the legislation, right? So what do you do when you actually find PCBs has been something that um, DEC has been the lead on with health and AOE providing support, but that's really had to be sort of invented whole cloth in the past you know, six months or so as we've really been engaging with schools and learning lessons as we've gone through. So it's been a, a tremendous kind of lift from the DEC team to develop this. So are we in this alone or is the federal government? There's more. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. You don't understand. I'm sorry. You guys are really smart. Okay. <laughs> Demanding. You're beavers. Right, right. I'm sorry. <laughs> it sounds That's like a nice good page. question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, <laughs> <You're that guy. laughs> so when there are PCBs identified in the school, there are options that the schools have. The funding that AOE has now can assist with some of those options for mitigation to allow for students and staff to stay in the classroom. Um, a lot of this work is also uh, involved 
the programs, this, the agency is creating a lot of technical documents, FAQs. Um, we've been having a lot of outreach meetings that have been um, spearheaded by AOE for us to try and make sure we're answering questions that superintendents and school officials have. Um, and then the other thing is uh, the development of a PCB database that we've created to allow for public access for all the information that we are gathering. And so once we do send that joint letter to the school, we, we have a 10-day clock um, for the school to get back to us. But after that 10 days, we also release the information publicly so that parents and caregivers can also look at that information. Um, we have provided templates for the schools to provide a letter to their community before testing starts and after testing starts to let them know what we're doing and what we found and what options are moving forward and sending them to the database to find that information. Um, so we are in constant communication with the United States Environmental Protection Agency that also has jurisdiction over PCBs. Um, the EPA delegates a lot of programs. They have not delegated PCBs, and so there are certain um, crossovers where there is dual jurisdiction in this um, arena, and so we are working very closely with them to make sure that any um, outcomes, directions, and, and work that's done is aligned with both the state and federal requirements so that there won't be any, hopefully no changes or different um, asks when we get to certain completion points. Um, the other part of the work that we're doing is we were able to use funding from the Department of Health and from DEC separate from the 4.5 million to contract with the University of Iowa to help us work through um, different ways to identify PCBs in schools and remediate them. So there's the um, University of Iowa Superfund Research Program and their whole program is based around sampling for PCBs in schools and you know, looking at the research available for the best ways to measure and the best ways to remediate and mitigate. And so they've been a valuable resource for us throughout this process. <clears throat> um, but just to get back to Senator Williams' <clears throat> earlier question, um, in, at least in Burlington, it, our situation did not come under a Superfund cleanup. Correct. And can you tell us why that is? Maybe. Um, partially yes so so EPA has similar um, statutory provisions that we had they do not um, address releases of contaminants in indoor air from building materials and so it's not something that they could regulate um, it is something that we looked at um, with the EPA removals program to see if there could be some assistance, but their regulations don't allow for them to regulate releases of PCBs from building materials. Um, if there were releases from the building to soil, to groundwater, to surface water, then there's there's a different um, ability from the EPA, but that is, that is the main reason why. So if PCBs were in the soils and other areas, then it would be different. Correct at much higher concentrations, much higher. yeah. They are, so as an example, um, there is a Superfund site in Bennington that is PCBs, mm -hmm. only PCBs, and it's PCBs in groundwater and soil and sediment, and it's from a former manufacturer that manufactured capacitors and the PCB oils leaked everywhere. Yeah. So that is a Superfund site, but that is the reason why it's really just the media and how the release occurred. Um, so the last piece that I have on this is really that um, DEC is working closely with EPA, as I said, but a lot of our documents related to assessment. So what happens when there are PCBs detected in indoor air, there's a requirement to start looking for what those sources are, which goes back to the inventory and how we're, we've set up the sampling process and then how to actually clean up the PCBs. And we're making sure that our documents um, and directive are aligned with EPA on those pieces. That's where most of the EPA regulations start to come in. So that's the program that yep. we've built and the general process and how it's working. So where are we? What have we done? How does it look right now? I think is the other question you probably want to hear from me. So I, I mentioned that there are 324 schools minus 40 that we're still waiting for. Um, to date, we've looked at 58 or created 58 um, approvals for inventories to start in the schools. Um, we've approved up to 39 schools for indoor air sampling right now. Um, the number of schools where one sample has exceeded the school action level is six. 
um, the number of schools where there is an exceedance of the immediate action level, and I didn't talk about that, but um, we have the school action level. Um, we asked the Department of Health to give us a number that basically says that at or above this number, um, you should not be in that space anymore. So an emergency action number, uh, immediate action level, so there's two locations there. Um, and then a uh, number of schools where the results have been below the school action level is 15. The table I have underneath that for you to see is really where we are with our ability to keep up with what we projected. So I mentioned we put schools into um, quarters for sampling and basically said you need to start your process within this quarter. So we were able to achieve everything we needed to for the first two quarters. The last quarter, which is October um, to December 31st, uh, there are seven schools that didn't start within that quarter, and so we're going to be reaching out to the consultants in the schools to make sure that we can make get, get them moving so that we can put that as a zero also. Um, I, I think I, I missed this when you were talking. Uh, I'm sorry, but SAL, that's safe action level? School action School level. action level. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and that's the 30, 60, 100, the values that health created for us. And, and that so, means you have to do something. Okay, so you have to... so. That six number means you have to do something, but that two means you have to do something immediately? Correct. Okay. It means that space can't be used until you can can't reduce used. that concentration. But the six, those six schools can use their space, but they have to actively do something. They have to actively do something, and then it goes back to the occupancy option. So based on what occupancy option the school chooses, mm -hmm. depends on whether or not they can use their space fully, or if they're gonna reduce the amount of time in that space, yeah. or if they're not gonna use that space at all. And that's part of what the joint letter from um, Health and ANR says when it goes to the school. Here are your options. Yeah. Let's talk about what they mean, which one works best for your school. Thanks, and, Senator and, Williams. And, oh, well, do they actually have, do you, the state do the testing or do you have uh, private firms to do it? We contracted with six different environmental consultants to do this work. So is that, is that an adequate number uh, to do it? Is, it? is that kind of put a constraint on time? Um, there are definitely some things that we've identified as time constraints. Some of it is the consulting community. I think, I, think, um, I don't know what's happened with our labor right now, but everyone's facing labor shortages. My program's facing labor shortages. That hasn't been the, uh, the reason for this, this, but it's certainly an uh, amazing amount of work happening with our environmental consultants, and this is just one more thing that we've added to it. Um, there were definitely some major delays that we had with the labs that we were using, and we were able to work out most of those issues also. So I'm hoping we're on the right path to, to completing the work that we said we'd do, um, but you know, those are definitely the hurdles we faced in the beginning. There's a very limited number of labs that do this, right? Four labs that do this mm -hmm. in the National country. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I just want to, to add a little bit more. So the, the do something here, if you're above the school action level, the sort of next steps, uh, once you're above that school action level, you're within the DEC regulatory framework, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's some really clear steps that need to be taken. We try to do what we call a pregame huddle uh, with folks that are going to be testing and sort of outline of what are your roles and responsibilities, what are the, the requirements that you need to meet. But um, obviously one of the first steps is to try to identify the source, right? Mm -hmm. And once you know the source of the PCBs, then DEC provides that technical support us as the consultant in what are the strategies that you can and activities that you can undertake. And some of those might be mitigation strategies, so strategies that you're going to do on a temporary <coughs> basis to reduce the amount of PCBs in the air. And we're trying to always balance that um, health and, and sort of safety risk versus uh, keeping students in school for in-person instruction, right? Having within the context of the pandemic, that educational impact is really critical. Mm -hmm. So those are some strategies that may be undertaken and it might be things like um, wet washing or cleaning out vents or covering up with special paints. Um, and in remediation, I've learned all these technical terms from Trish over the last year. I'm very proud of myself. <laughs> remediation is the permanent removal. And so that may come quite a bit later, depending on you know what the scope of the problem may be. And so those are like the, you know, you said 
Okay, school action level, what does that mean? It means you have to do something, and these are some of the things that you may be doing. And that would also play with your occupancy of that space. If you are taking immediate action to lower the amount of PCBs within in your air, then it would be safe for students and staff to remain in that space. But if you um, are not going to be able to take those steps, then maybe you need to reduce the amount of time that students are spending in that space. Maybe you have additional space that you can, you know, instead of doing music class in that room, maybe you can do music class in this room. So working with the schools on those kind of logistic and operational considerations is part of why we have three agencies involved and really close contact with the schools to make these decisions. So. Senator Hillwood. I swear you're reading my mind. Um, I don't know how you do that, but. So the two schools that exceed the IAL, I'm assuming they're included in the six that exceeded the SAL? Is that, so is that a total of okay, six schools rather than eight? They, they're, it's the exceedances of the IAL were actually in ancillary spaces. So they were like closet spaces that exceeded the school action level. So we still use the lowest age that's in the school. So if it's a pre-K, then 30 is that lowest age and 90 is the IAL for that. And we have some exceedances that are in closet spaces, storage spaces. So it's still an exceedance of the IAL, but it doesn't really change what has to happen in the school right away because it's not fully occupied all the time. Okay. We're still working with the school to address the issue. Yep. Great, thanks. Sarah Williams. How do we budget for this? Hmm. Yeah. Which part? Oh, well, <laughs> for, for, for the whole thing. I mean, we don't know what we don't know. Right. Yeah. So, is there some place, is there obviously is some federal funding available? No. So, yeah. this is out of high. And we, so, more specifically, in uh, James, in your budget, there's no line item covering any. Yeah. yeah. But, but the testing is fully funded, is that correct? I mean, the testing has been funded from previous. There's 4.5 million, depending on how well that moves forward, it may or may not cover all of the work that needs to happen. Well, there's some money. Yeah, that. so I can, I can speak a little bit to this. So just putting some brackets around this, uh, you have a report coming from uh, the secretaries from ANR and AOE and mm -hmm. secretaries Moore and French will be speaking to this. So in some sense, I'm, I'm going to defer to them. But here's our here's our context: is that in the last session, um, as part of the Ed Fund surplus, 32 million dollars was identified for PCB mitigation and remediation. But uh, of that funding, only 2.5 million was made available, um, essentially to respond to immediate needs that were happening over the past year and a funding proposal is required of uh, AOE and ANR which you should have you know at kind of any minute now uh, or, or today at some point hopefully um, for what to do with the, the bulk of the funding so um, the 2.5 million is you know in the bank for the agency of education it did require that AOE and ANR go in front of the emergency board, which uh, we did in October, um, with a sort of proposal for how to use those funds. And they're very specific uses. So um, those funds can be used at an 80-20 cost share. So 80% on the state, 20% on the, um, the district or the independent school. I always want to remind us that independent schools are also part of this picture. Um, and specifically for DEC approved costs, that's our control, right? They're in a regulatory framework now, so when they um, have these costs, they have to be approved by DEC, and then that way AOE knows it's okay to pay the check, right? We're not experts on this. Um, for costs associated with the, um, like the development of a work plan uh, by the consultant, um, source material testing, right? So we know it's in the air, but we've gotta find out what the source of it is. And then mitigation strategies. Specifically, we cannot use any of those funds for permanent removal or remediation of the PCBs. So to date, um, we have two schools that have incurred costs 
Um, one of them has a fully DEC approved work plan and the other is sort of underway. Um, and I frankly I was working on today, I'm in the process of building out the grant. It's a reimbursement grant. The, the school knows what they'll be reimbursed for, so there's no issue right now. We haven't paid any cost to date, um, but we do know that we will. So the remainder, the big bulk of it, the 32 million, you'll receive a funding proposal on that, and I'm sure you'll have comments and questions at that point that you can ask the secretaries. <laughs> so there's no, no remediation funding authorized, is that because we're doing this in phases? Uh, it's because that's how the legislation was written. Oh. <laughs> so yeah, but I will I will say that we're I mean where we're at with this is that um, the soonest that we would be expecting uh, remediation activities to be taking place, which would probably be Cabot School, will be this summer. So right now, um, the schools that are above the school action level are identifying sources, coming up with uh, mitigation activities to keep students in those spaces safely. Um, so we're in the, what I would call like sort of the bridge, the holding pattern until the permanent removal can happen. How are families responding to the letters? You're at home, you get a letter, your yeah. school has PCBs in it. What are, you, what are you hearing and seeing? We're getting a minimal amount of questions. Okay. Um, not a lot of questions. Okay. Um, so the letter must and be pretty we've comprehensive. Seen, yeah, I mean, I think the, the, big, the big question is, you know, are, do we have another Burlington at this point? And the yeah. answer is no, not so far. Would you email a draft uh, Aiden of the letter just so we can see it? Yeah, see it yeah absolutely. <laughs> I don't think we're getting those kind of questions from parents. No. They're, they're asking us specifically some health-related questions that go to health yeah. um, and um, some questions maybe around reduction and what's being done, but, but not a, a large amount of... People aren't pulling their kids. That's, no, that's... and where we've seen in the spaces themselves, okay. so I think Cabot's a good example. We've, we've had PCBs in the gym and in the art room. And at Danville School, the school they've been in some of those ancillary spaces. So the school was able to respond. They were able to keep pre-K kids out of the art space and the gym. You know, it, during uh, one period, it was you know, all students were out of the gym for a bit and then it was established that it was safe for them to be in the gym. So we haven't had a situation where the whole school is impacted. It's been particular spaces and the schools, I think, by and large, have done an excellent job. They know their communities well and they're, they're communicating really clearly with them and saying, this is where we're at <coughs> in this process, right? And I think as long as there's movement forward. Senator Gulick and Senator Weeks. Uh, a couple of things. Um, can you tell us which two schools are benefiting from that 2.5 million? I think one is Cabot. Cabot, and it, it will most likely be Oak Grove once they have a DEC approval. Oak Grove. Plan. And then can, can you, just to give us context, because I think maybe one of the reasons you're not getting a lot of letters is that you really are, you, you know, Vermont takes care of its people, or at least tries, and your levels are fairly conservative, and, and people feel relatively safe. And I was just wondering if you could give us a comparison of like what the national level is nationwide, or like, because I've heard numbers thrown around, and same thing with the EU. I've heard like the EU has a number. I was just curious if you could share that with us. Or if it's not that simple, it might not be that simple. I'm afraid to give you a wrong number. There's a there is um, a a document out that was from the University of Iowa where they've done a lot of work, just providing information on what that background value is, um, and I I just don't have it at the top of my head, so I can't give that to you okay. right now. But uh, so the University of Iowa, that's probably a public document that if you wanted to look at, we I'm could. I'm happy to send it to you okay. or to this okay. committee. Thanks. <coughs> so. Um, Certainly a great effort. Uh, I'm curious though, kind of the, um, the risks uh, from the past, like uh, lead, radon, asbestos, do we feel comfortable that, that we're beyond that? Is, that? is that kind of a fair assessment that we recognize those at the time and we've moved beyond? It's Radon testing is actually another <laughs> uh, piece of statute from 2021. 2021. Yeah. Uh, all schools are required to test for radon by June of 2025. 
that doesn't belong to any particular agency. No agency was assigned that or has oversight over it, so the schools are just sort of required to do it. Okay. So the answer on rate on is we don't know what's out there. Still in progress. In, in progress, and I would say in infancy. Okay. Yeah. Your question is a good one. I mean, in part, <laughs> it's, it's so then what's going to be next? Right. I thought we had a, just to interject here, a complete school inventory at one point that was being done or is. Yeah, so this is. That was looking at almost everything or, well, or was it more the building? It's the building. This is part of Act yeah. 72, okay. which uh, will not surprise you. I'm always happy to come in and chat yeah. about leading that work as well. Um, and so we did a self-reported facilities inventory last year and the comprehensive facilities assessment is underway right now and will be the work will be completed by October of this year yes. um, but it doesn't it's not testing for radon it's not testing for PCBs that's it's the it's the facilities condition okay. itself so when you say assessment you're talking about this square footage of this type of room or? Yeah, so know. looking at the age and condition of all major systems, looking at the capacity to deliver 21st century education, um, looking at um, uh, any upcoming major construction, and it's all being driven towards um, sort of the end result of Act 72, which was an omnibus facilities bill. Um, the end result is to have a clear understanding of what our kind of facilities debt is since we have had a moratorium on state spending on school construction and facilities since 2008. And then also to be able to guide um, school districts in making five-year capital investment plans. We'll look at Act 72 next week when we yeah. key check in also. And also, hopefully, our federal delegation can help us with some of this. I think Rebecca Ellis from Peter Welch's office hopefully can join us. And just know that this is something we're facing, but everybody in the country is going to be facing. Please, Senator. Williams. Just, just a general question. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we'll get answered later. But so this legislature will pass a bill, not assign responsibility to a to an agency, and and not a, and not assign a budget item. Are you thinking about the? Are you talking about the radon? Yeah. Yeah. Any, any. You yeah. know, the radon thing is a good question. Uh, I think what we asked for, and we can go back and take a look, uh, is you know basically in five years, give us a report what those radon numbers look like. I think those numbers would also go to the superintendents and others so they can act on them. But we'll follow up and see. It, it, your point's a good one, and it's well taken, that it did surprise me a little bit that nothing, nobody's, if the work is being done, and we might have to, like, for and example, you could test today, yeah. right now it could be high, and the solution could be easy, and nobody's acting on it. So, And right. the schools are the ones that have the responsibility to do the testing. The staff. No, right, I understand, yeah. but to, to Senator uh, Williams' point, I think, you know, when, when can we start to see these numbers? What are some of the things happening? Yeah. You know, if somebody does have a question, who do they call up and say, hey, our radon numbers are off the chart? We've heard that it can be easy as ventilation and it can be much more serious yeah. good question please uh, any, anything else <laughs> <laughs> my big question is if Jill got her scarf back oh right it's over there it's over there okay yes. good yeah we were really worried about that oh well, thank you I have yeah. some more scarves <laughs> As soon as I put it on, I think I'm losing that. <laughs> School construction is going to be a big part of, you know, our conversations this session, without a doubt. And how can we help districts with some of these funding issues? And it, it, Act 72, it, so it's not only, you know, some bricks and mortar kinds of things, but are these 21st century institutions that kids can really It includes learn. an energy audit, a two-year yeah. energy audit as well. Yeah. It's a pretty comprehensive yeah. assessment. When will we get that? Um, you should have all the reports will be completed by October of 2023, and then we'll have a legislative report in January of 24 with like the big ticket numbers. Okay. And let's say that just requiring AOE, ANR, and Health to work together on the PCB piece it definitely has put us into a better relationship 
not that we had a bad one, but a closer relationship with AOE. But it does allow for where there is construction work to happen to be, you know, um, aligned with some of the PCB work that needs to happen and potentially any of the other work that would be lead paint and asbestos and address it all at once while the school is under construction so that you don't have to go back and do it later. So there's definitely more coordination happening around the needs of a school and how to you know, create a better environment. Yeah. And I've certainly seen in my community, you know, some who's at falls, uptick in cancer rates mm -hmm. from PFAS, things like that. I can even think of some personal experiences when family members grew up on Lake Champlain on the other side when they would go swimming and those right through those paper mills mm -hmm. when they were kids and you know come 72 late 60s damn it mm -hmm. just seems you know and this is my just anecdotal not scientific but um yeah these are serious things mm -hmm. yeah. and certainly I I would echo what Trish is saying other states are paying attention here so I think we're on the the leading edge yeah. which means we we're bearing the, the cuts and bruises of it, but you know, we do good work in this state. So and I think it's as kids are developing. I mean, my age, I'm not sure how much if I got exposed to PCBs now. I mean, what have I got? Would you say we have 20 years left? <laughs> 40, 40, 40, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, but if you're little, that's where you know you get impacted. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. so. Thank you very much. Yeah, mm -hmm. sounds like Senator Kulik's done. Um, <laughs> sorry, uh, 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 I thought she showed remarkable restraint. I did. Yeah, that was great. That was great. Anything else? Anything else? Thanks. Thank All right. you. Seriously, Thank thanks. You. All right. Okay, committee. Certainly, certain things are coming uh, to the forefront uh, that we'll be working on. School construction is one of them, and uh, as I think this Teach in Vermont campaign, uh, the House will send us a bunch of things. That's but, exciting. Yeah, I like that. I think there are a bunch of things that are bubbling up. That's cool. So we're adjourned for today.